and B would go down there and, and get some some wisdom and advice from him from time to time. That was back in the days when when civic buildings were a vibrant part of the community. They were architecture and scale wise in sync with the community, but they were in the community. And uh, then this is where I kind of take the fire hat, fire chief's hat off, and you know, and and, and look at it from a more of a civic minded approach. Fire stations should be in your in your on your not your major thoroughfares necessarily, not in your your side streets, but they need to be part of your community. Somewhere in that town square should be the fire station if it's applicable. All right, and to give you a, an example, if you look at the, the the image on the on the left there, the fire station, that's a brand new fire station in Oakland, California. I say brand new; it's built within the past four or five years. That fire station replaced the fire station that was on the very edge of the neighborhood. And they put the fire station back into the center of the neighborhood. And what it is, it becomes, again, one of those, those, those civic buildings. It's a neighborhood center. You, the firefighters are now part of that community. And on the downside, it's kind of like the, the NIMBY thing. And, and in my field of work, the hardest thing to do is put a fire station in a neighborhood. What's the second hardest thing to do? You got it. Take it out. That's exactly right. It uh, it depends on where you're at on, on the on the time scale. If you grew up with that neighborhood fire station being in your neighborhood, you want it there. Now, what what most people don't understand is there's more criteria than just you know pin the tail on the donkey, and we put fire stations where where we think they. There's a methodology to that. It's got engineering background and time to motion and all kinds of different things going on that we deal with. But really where the opportunity is there, the, the fire service, the fire department should be an integral part of that community. Not out on the bypass necessarily, but if, it, if at all possible, build fire stations and build them to the scale that fits the, the, uh, the neighborhood. I, I wanted to show you that image on the upper right. If you look real close to see what's going on, you get the little kid in, in, the, in the engine room. Now, we're not here to talk about these kinds of things primarily today, but, but again, it illustrates that the, 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 fire, the fire department, its fire stations can be an integral part of, of the neighborhood. The, the complete streets concept in, in high density, or not necessarily high density, but more close-knit neighborhoods offers a community uh, in, in so many different benefits from the emergency services perspective. I'm not here to speak on behalf of the law enforcement community. I'm sure there's someone up there uh, uh, around that could get up and do the same kind of discussion with in terms of crime reduction and, and police protection. But from a fire station, and by the way, let me also add, over 50% of the emergency medical services in this country are delivered through the fire service. Put that in real simple terms, that's ambulances. Not just the, the engine responding uh, with a, an ambulance company, but over 50% of the EMS service in this country is provided through the fire department. It makes sense. You have the infrastructure there, you have the staffing there, uh, the, 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 all the, the resources that, that generally speaking, um, is needed for that service. It parallels the fire protection field and, and over the past 30, 40 years from the, uh, let me see if it, anybody remembers this, the Gage and DeSoto days. May know the, the one I'm talking about? You ever watched the show back in the 70s, Emergency? Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto, the little red squad truck, okay. Those are paramedics. A lot of fire departments now provide I'd say most fire departments now provide the first responder to all medical life-threatening medical emergencies in your community. To give you an example, in my city, we do not operate the ambulances out of the fire station. That's a county function. However, every one of our firefighters are at a minimum an EMT, and a third of them are paramedics. They can push drugs, all right? They're just one step below that RN or, 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 or emergency room type uh, assistant. Um, and what we do is we send the closest engine company, fire engine, uh, with these trained medical staff to life-threatening emergencies. Our average response time in our city is four minutes or less, average, all right? Average response time for an ambulance is, is over eight minutes, okay? What we do is we augment that service. 
How many of y'all have ever had a call for an ambulance? Pass. How many, how many of y'all had a fire truck show up with uh, the ambulance, if not before the ambulance? Is that okay. a requirement in a lot of communities that the fire uh, service show up with the ambulance? It's not necessarily a requ requirement. But it is a common practice now because they're they're going by not requirements but national guidelines. Within eighty percent of the time, get a a, a, a a what we call BLS level service, basic life support, i.e. EMT or greater, on the scene uh, in four four minutes or less, eighty percent of the time, followed by an ALS advanced life support unit, i.e. a paramedic unit, they're 80% of the time within eight minutes. Most private ambulance services cannot meet that benchmark of four minutes. So they use the fire department as that stopgap, if you will, to make that happen. The other reason is is, is that in the in the in a lot of times the ambulances get backlogged. Our crews have been sitting there with a patient for 15 minutes or greater, not able to transport because the What's happening in America is that the system is being saturated with non-critical calls, but we cannot say no, we have to follow through. So whereas used to someone had an ailment or a condition, someone would drive them to the emergency room or to the doctor's office. You know what they do now? They call 911. That's one of the down downsides of 911. It's a great system, don't get me wrong. But that's one of the challenges we now have is, is the overuse of that system. I want to give you an example of two cities that where higher density neighborhoods can, can uh, offer great savings to a community in terms of public services, in this case, fire protection. Glendale, California, it's a population of 191,000. Anybody ever been to Glendale? It's part of the LA urbanized area. It's, it's literally touching the northern border of, of Los Angeles City. Uh, Glendale, uh, Pasadena, and Burbank. The, they all touch each other and touch the northern part of the, the LA City. But if you look at the population of Glendale, it's 191,000 in an area of 30 square miles. It has nine fire stations and 237 personnel. In contrast, right down the road from my community is Little Rock, Arkansas. It's got 193,000, almost the same population, with an area served of 119 square miles with 23 fire stations and more than 400 firefighters. You see the point I'm trying to make? Glendale, not necessarily because of new urbanism and, and, and complete streets, but Glendale is a very high density uh, community, uh, very compact. But in contrast, Little Rock is more of an urban, suburban, sprawl type city. Uh, and also, it's not landlocked like Glendale, and it keeps annexing and annexing. And then what does it do? It annexes some more and some more. I'm sorry, what? Building fire stations. It builds fire. And they're opening the 20, 23rd or 24th fire station as we speak right down the road from some friends of mine. So you can see where sprawl can increase the cost of public services. I want to talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the, the code officials and what they enforce. Um, there are primarily two organizations that create what I call, or what they call model codes and standards in America. The National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, that I just mentioned earlier, and the ICC, International Code Council. How many of y'all? How many of y'all are familiar with either one of those? ICC writes a model building code and an accompanying fire code. Most people don't realize it, but your building code is written in blood. It is written after hundred years plus of disasters that has caused people to say, you know what? In a room this size, we better have at least X number of exits, and they better be separate from each other, and so on and so forth. And the history is, is full just in this country in the past hundred years of disastrous fires, which has driven the creation of building codes. And those building codes, most people don't realize it, but roughly 67% of a building code is a fire code. 
The ICC publishes those codes and some of the, the access requirements such as street width is not arbitrary though there may not be a lot of engineering behind it there's a lot of gut feeling in it and that's where in recent years there's been kind of a clash in, in codes making between the new urbanism uh, movement and and the, the long-standing existing uh, codes and standards. Usually that, that standard is, is boilerplate 20 feet. However, in some states you may, or local, certain areas of a state, you may find it uh, wider or narrower, but generally speaking, 20 feet for uh, uh, fire department access on mercy uh, lanes and so forth. Those other images, if you look there, uh, the picture on the lower left, that's Boston, Massachusetts in the blizzard 1977. Some of the challenges that the fire service has with narrow streets is it's not just the day to day, but as you can see, the snow was piled up and they just barely had room just to get an apparatus in there. That's not including all the parked cars and the banks of snow and I, I, I no tell them what else. But these are some of the things where their perspective is. This is where they're coming from. The picture on the lower right, I've got to keep up with my, my time frame here, but just very quickly, anybody ever heard of the Oakland Hills Fire in 1991, Oakland, California? One of the biggest contributors to that disaster where 25 people were killed was because of narrow streets. Fire apparatus could not get around parked cars that were abandoned by uh, uh, the residents running for their lives. In this one picture here, there were more than one fire fatality all inside their cars. Fire overwhelmed them as they were trying to get out. No organization, fire apparatus trying to get in, people trying to get out. They, sh they could have gotten out if they had listened to the public, uh, local officials, including the fire chiefs and so forth. Get out now, not when the fire is right down at the bottom of the valley. They had plenty of time to leave, but what did they do, like many of us would do? I'm not leaving my home. I mean, you have that kind of feeling about it. But what happened was they all of a sudden realized this is more than what I thought it was going to be. I got to get out of here. And this is the result. In the United States, that those building codes, and believe it or not, your insurance premium is all tied into urban conflagrations. Uh, what I mean by conflagrations, that is a fire that's burning out of control. Uh, from one structure to the other. It's overwhelming the, the emergency services, the fire protection, the fire department, the water supply, and so forth. This is a picture, an image from a conflagration that occurred sometime probably back in the 1950s around uh, Brooklyn, New York, one of the neighborhoods in Brooklyn. One of the, some of the key contributing factors, narrow streets, on-street parking, and this, another, don't get me wrong, I'm not painting the picture anti parking on streets and anti-narrow lanes. I'll get to that in just a moment. But as you can see, this is the perspective the fire service has. This is a, a, a conflagration. And then you're going to see here in just a moment, when you start to add this, the topography, like you find in San Francisco, you're going to see what will happen. Uh, here's a, a fire, I believe this is in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, back in the, the 50s or the 60s in, in the Dor Dor Dorchester section of Boston, which is uh, uh, full of what they call three-deckers. Those are those homes, as you can see there, that are, that are high density, uh, almost zero lot line construction, three stories tall. Typically, there's wood combustible porches on all levels on the backside, and they are conflagration breeders, big time. And so here's the challenges that the fire service has in inner city uh, uh, fire protection is what, what looks like to us or, or would be great neighborhoods, and they are great neighborhoods, but the history has shown the fire service these are the problems. That history has also influenced how we rate cities in terms of fire protection. Everybody owns their home or has renter's insurance here, I'm, I'm assuming. And part of your, your insurance goes towards fire protection or fire insurance. A, and so the fire insurance industry oh, for over 100 years has influenced indirectly or indirectly the design of communities. They supported wider streets because the history of, of conflagrations in this country were just one city after another. Hartford had a conflagration. Uh, 
up and down the rail line or the highway, most towns in this state have had some form of group, what we call group fires, block after block burning or an all that conflagration. Here's to illustrate what a fire can do even on a fairly wide street. If you look at the image on the left, that's a recent fire in what we call the urban interface. A suburban sprawl has allowed people to live closer and closer into the urban interface. And if you've read the headlines and just in recent weeks or days, there's a wildland urban interface going on right now as we speak in some western states where they have some really long dry spells. It's not necessarily just a western uh, phenomenon. It happens over here on the east part of the country, just not as often. But as often, on the right, that is a, a fire that has erupted in a downtown section of New Orleans right after Katrina hit. Abandoned streets, fire gets out of control, and, and most people cannot perceive this, but fires will jump streets in a building. Just because your building is made out of stone, concrete, or brick, or a combination thereof, don't think that it won't burn. It will burn. It'll burn fast and burn very deadly. This is San Francisco, 1906. I mentioned this earlier. Not only did they have the, the issue of the narrow streets, they had lots of frame structures. San Francisco is known for those, those old Victorian homes. There's that one image everybody sees. If you do a Google image search, you'll see that one picture taken from the park. Uh, those, that's, those neighborhoods still exist. Another thing is they have this. As I illustrate to people, when you light a match, which way does the flame go? If I turn the match upside down, which way does the flame go? It goes up. Heat rises. Remember that. Pretty simple uh, science class type uh, situation. When you have a terrain like you have in San Francisco where you have hills and heat goes up and you have nothing but a, 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 just full of combustible structures, it's going to burn. It's going to burn fast. And fire will burn downhill too, but typically that heat's going to carry that up. The, so that's what you have in San Francisco, and that's one of the biggest contributors uh, to to the problem. And that, that and the, plus the fact that the fire service was was crippled because of the earthquake, and so was the water system. Here's some images of San Francisco. I want to put this in here. This top is a panoramic view of the city burning, but if you look on the lower lower left. That was the newly created, or newly constructed San Francisco City Hall. Who says a steel frame or a concrete masonry type building doesn't burn? Look at the image on the right. You see the skeleton of a building. That's not a building under construction. That is a building that's completely burned out. All that was left was the steel frame. National Board of Fire Underwriters, which is an organization, it's now called ISO, Insurance Services Office. Has anybody ever heard of that, that uh, organization? They're the ones that come in and rate every city and town in the United States, all 48,000. I've been around since 1866. In 1905, they did a nationwide survey of all major cities in the United States. And the survey they did in, in uh, San Francisco, remember one year before the earthquake and fire, is some of the conflagration hazards they identified. If you notice, one, one is highlighted there in the, in the second bullet, probability features, comparatively narrow streets. And if you look, what's really interesting in the summary, in the bottom says, in fact, San Francisco has violated all underwriting traditions and, and present by not burning, bur burning up. Uh, that, that it has not done so largely due to the diligence of the fire department, et cetera, et cetera. And it burned, ironically, the next year. And all those factors up there were contributor to that uh, burning. Here's London, the Blitz of 1940, when the Germans bombed London. If I put this in here to, to show you how if buildings are close together, how fire literally can travel from one side of the street to the other, if, particularly the lower, the lower uh, uh, left picture. If the fire started in the buildings on the right, and by, by radiant heat, travel over to masonry uh, wall buildings on the other side. Talked about the urban interface. Again, here's Oakland, California. The image on the lower right, though, is not Oakland. It's more recent fire that occurred, I believe, last year 
uh, somewhere on, on the western states. And if you notice the wall of fire coming towards that, that neighborhood. Let's talk about fire apparatus design very quickly. The, upper, the image on the upper right is your standard fire engine, your pumper truck. The middle image is, is one form of a ladder truck uh, that has become very common and popular in the American Fire Service. And then look at the lower one. To scale, if you look at the tires and picture how long that thing is, how long do you think that, that, that ladder truck is? Roughly 50 feet or more. If you notice really close on the back side of that thing, there's a little cab up there on the very back. That's called a tiller seat. There's a, there's a firefighter that steers the back end of that. Believe it or not, that ladder truck and lower ends can go places that one in the middle can't. The one in the middle is about 40 feet. The tiller ladder truck never went away in some cities, but in other cities it's, it's, it's having a resurgence. People are realizing because of traffic congestion, on street parking, narrow streets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like in this case, Los Angeles, they never got away from the tiller ladder truck. It's very, very maneuverable. Uh, most cities have, have steered away from it. They don't see the value in it. But some cities, Baltimore, Washington D.C., New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, some others, they've always kept the the, the tiller ladder truck. It's a very maneuverable piece of equipment. It's often overlooked as an option by the local officials in terms of addressing the accessibility and the speed and so forth through the tight neighborhoods. On the left is a typical American fire engine. On the right is one from the London Fire Brigade or right British Fire Service. Uh, uh, one of the issues that we have in America in terms of narrow streets is that is Getting down the street's one thing, but operating fire trucks on the scene is becoming a challenge because the hoses that go from the hydrant into the fire engine and, and then out of the fire engine out to the, uh, the firefighting operations, if you look at the lower middle image, you'll see the, the, the distance that the hose comes out once it's being uh, uh, under pressure coming out from the, what we call the pump or the pump panel. In contrast, the lower, the lower image on the right that's, a, that's the back end of this British engine. Everything comes out the back. So you don't have that, that obstacle problem. And like I said before, one of the problems we have is not just getting down the street. It's once we get to the scene, as you saw in those pictures of those configurations, we've got to be able to maneuver and operate. It's not as easy as a straight force, a straight line, one in front of the other. They've got to be able to maneuver around each other. Depending on where they're, they're going to place that aerial ladder, they've got to be able to have the flexibility to move that ladder truck. Uh, somewhere, if you've got high density type uh, construction. One of the challenges we have is compartment doors. Now, I will say this, that the, what you're looking at on the right, those are roll-up doors versus the ones on the left, which are hinged doors, which is more, more common in America. But in America, we're slowly starting to embrace the roll-up door because of clearance problems, uh, because of parked cars and so forth. Ladder mounts. Uh, in America, with pumper trucks, typically the ladders are going to be on the sides or some kind of hydraulic uh, lowering device is going to bring them from the top out and down. But in, 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 uh, in other places, and this is the, the back of the Los Angeles tiller ladder truck, they go out the back of, the, of the, uh, the apparatus instead of the sides. Again, because that high density on street parking, they want to access those ground ladders. Here's a on the upper left, this again your typical ladder truck that you may see in American City versus the one on the on the right, which is a, a British a type uh, apparatus. Um, you can see they're both rear mount, but the one on the right is a little shorter wheelbase. It's more uh, uh, compact. If you look at the lower images, the one on the lower left, that's your outrigger for a typical American fire engine. If you look at the one on the, on the lower right, that's one that you're seeing of the ladder truck above it. Uh, the, the European design. They still have to have outriggers and they still take up space, but not near as much. Uh, access in terms of streets, not just streets, but also alleys. And we got in this brief conversation last night about, about you know, new urbanism principles reintroduce things that we had years and years ago that are, one of them would be in alleys. We like alleys because it gives us more flexibility uh, to, to uh, approach a structure than just from the street front. 
but we have to get down those alleys from time to time. Uh, another image, again, this is Boston. This is the blizzard of 77. You can see how the streets, uh, uh, access to buildings and so forth was hampered by the, the snow. Up in the northeast here, you're, you're going to see that more common than anywhere else. I would, I would say. Uh, another image showing you, you know, it's not as simple as going straight down the street and stopping straight. There's reasons why the fire service often will need to have that apparatus at an angle, whether it's a high hookup or whatever the case may be. And just another image of what some of the obstacles and some of the challenges they have in, in their operations. Uh, another neighborhood image. Alternate solutions to, to uh, our uh, just a, a, a managing from a, a res emergency response perspective. Some, some uh, alternatives might be to reduce that fire risk, therefore reducing the need for emergency services uh, in terms of large amounts of fire apparatus, built-in systems, sprinkler systems. How many of y'all uh, are familiar with the, with the concept of sprinkler systems? Okay, how many of y'all think that if that head goes off, all the heads in the whole building goes off? If you did, okay. You got one guy, I'll say it, you know. But in actuality, most people don't realize if that were the case, you wouldn't want sprinkler systems. Because it would do as much damage as a fire does and then some 10 times, 20 times as much. Most people don't realize that that sprinkler head is activated. When it activates, it doesn't activate any other other of these, of these heads in these rooms, they work independently. What causes that head to go off is ceiling temperature. And there's either, either a bulb with liquid in that head that'll, that'll, that'll expand under heat and that bulb will burst and water come out of the pipe and hit the deflector and do the umbrella effect. Or it's gonna be a piece of metal, like metal is gonna do the same thing. But sprinklers have been around, for, they've been around for about 130 years and the data shows that 98 98% of the time, if the sprinkler system is designed, installed, and maintained correctly, they will extinct, they will hold the fire in check, if not completely extinguish the fire before the fire department gets here, with only one or two heads. Those heads are activated by the heat. Fire starts over here on the table, ceiling temperature rises, the bulb in that head expands, it pops, the water comes out. As soon as the water comes out of that head, it sends an alarm and trips this fire alarm system here and sends a message to the fire department automatically. Okay? That's a concept most people don't realize. They know there's sprinkler heads, but they see the commercials on TV and they think, oh gosh, we don't want that. Don't want sprinklers. But actually, in some communities across the country, residential sprinklers are being introduced. Narrow streets, fire marshal wants wider streets. Let's compromise. Let's talk about this. What if we put sprinkler systems? in all this new development, including single family residential, you get a cut in your insurance rate, probably. It's going to pay for itself in four to six years. Plus, it's going to reduce the severity of the fire once the fire department gets there. Okay, uh, Thus reducing, instead of a, a fire escalating to a, a, what we call room and content, where fire is burning, blowing out the windows, and we're flowing 200 to 400 gallons of water a minute to only 18 gallons of water a minute per head something to think about in terms of alternative solutions. Here's my, here's my department. Very quickly, we, we were in the business of, of, of purchasing three new pumper trucks out of four, I'm sorry, out of five, in 2008. I was given my career opportunity to illustrate as a fire chief I'd only been the fire chief there since 2007. It was a great opportunity for me to finally uh, exercise what I believed in, and that is design fire trucks around the needs of the community and not design the community around fire trucks. Something to think about. The average length of a fire engine pumper is around 30 to 32 feet. When we came up with our new apparatus, as you see there in that illustration, our, our total length is 27 foot 3 inches and the and, uh, turning radius of 161 inches. We, we, once they took delivery of them, we dr drove them to the cul-de-sacs around town, some tight streets and everything. No problems. It's such a small and compact rig. And by the way, it serves the same function that the others did, that we replaced in the inside. Our challenge is we have limited resources, including manpower, or staffing, I'm sorry, staffing, 
And what we what we try to do is package everything that we can into one rig so we didn't have multiple rigs going through car accidents and doing extrication and so forth. We cut down the number of units from five to three using our existing staffing with a new apparatus. Since we've, we've introduced this design, other cities across our communities across the country have asked us to uh, provide them with our specs. Actually, we stole the specs from Riverside County, California, where they have an urban interface problem, but we modified it slightly for our needs. So there is where we did a, a, an example where a community needs to do a, a needs analysis in terms of the community, the environment, the fire service is working in and design accordingly. Tokyo, Japan, narrow streets, uh, very walkable neighborhoods, very challenging for the fire service. Anybody ever been to Tokyo? It's a great city. It's, it's an interesting place to go. But as you can see, that's on the left, that's very typical uh, in Tokyo. Here's their typical uh, solution to the problem. Very tight, short wheelbase, small uh, fire apparatus. Now bear in mind, a different culture, different building environment, a different evolution of the fire service, uh, but it does illustrate thinking out of the box, trying to find ways to uh, provide the service uh, and adapt to the environment they're in. London, England, very similar European look though. Uh, again, here's the, here's the, uh, their uh, examples. Uh, we already saw the, uh, the, the pumper truck on the right. There's a the rear view on the upper left of their typical ladder truck. It's still a large vehicle, but it's very compact and it reaches the same height as American ladders do. All right, to wrap it up, um, just as a little note, I think the firefighter in the back room can appreciate this. Don't park in front of firefighters. <laughs>